Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Jason Roberts, founder of Builder Better Block. How are you doing today, Jason? Doing really well. Thanks. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. Now, you're still based in Texas, is that right? Yeah, we're based in uh, Dallas, Texas, a neighborhood called Oak Cliff, which is about two miles or so southwest of uh, the downtown center. And you really got started in your neighborhood doing work, didn't you? Yeah, uh, started back in 2010, but, uh, you know, developing the Better Block Project. But really, it was kind of uh, built upon a series of other civic projects um, that I've uh, been working on based on kind of trying to figure out, you know, how to bring back an old a trolley car to our neighborhood and trying to work on revitalizing buildings that weren't working anymore and then looking at um, um, some of the, uh, you know, bike, uh, how do you get people bicycling? And so Better Block was kind of a culmination of, of those things and, and, and a, a learning process. And then tr- how do you put it all together and, uh, and, hmm. and, and make a great place? Well, I, I'm intrigued with, with those different disparate threads that you've, of projects you've been involved in. How do you kind of define uh, your role comprehensively? Uh, how do I define my role comprehensively or our role? Um, that's a good question. Well, I think really, uh, you know, that we look at, we look at our projects kind of in a holistic manner, trying to figure out, you know, what, you know, knowing that everything starts with the street, hmm. right? Everything's built off of that. And then how are you, um, how are you making the, the, the area or the neighborhood as successful as possible? What, what needs to happen on the edges and yeah, in, in, in the center, and so uh, it's, it's really, again, it's, a, it's also kind of looking at, you know, the symbiotic relationships of, uh, of land use to uh, the public realm uh, and the streets itself. So it's, it's this, you know, we, we've, we talk about with our work, you know, we can, you know, we can go in and retrofit, you know, a, a street to have a bike lane, but there's nothing to bike to. It, it's not, the area is not going to be successful. So you have to be kind of mindful how everything works together. I'm I'm really intrigued with this this idea of starting with the street. Why is that so important for you all? Well, because you know that's where that's where all the activity. I mean, that, that's your public. I mean, that's that's kind of the start of your public realm. Mm-hmm. And we found if you get the you get the street wrong, everything else goes wrong around it. So, you know, if the city's going to build a six lane road, you're going to have a certain type of development <laughs> pattern that that's uh, beside it, right? But I think we all have a vision on in our minds of what it what does a successful city look like, and I, I don't think there's that connection that's made to well there's uh, when you're you're developing a successful city, and that means not just for you know people working in the city, but also you know living in there and and and, and traversing the space and bringing your family in and, you, and you're growing old in the space. And so um, keeping all of those things in mind. Uh, uh, you develop a street network to kind of get you through these spaces. You know, if you develop it a certain way, you're going to have a certain behavioral pattern take place. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we've seen, you know, one that's based more on getting people to drive everywhere. Uh, but if you make the street compelling uh, for people to kind of uh, uh, to walk, you know, you're going to get a completely different development pattern. Hmm. It's it's so fascinating because I don't know that many of us think of that street as public space, and I guess that's that's probably often because it's not developed in such a way that it is conveniently public space, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's it, I, there's a, a lot of things I've, I've kind of come to think of as a public space that I don't think are traditional. Like we also kind of think about the the facades of buildings because if hmm. we as a community have to kind of traverse through these spaces and look upon these things and they're facing us. That's also our public realm as well, even though it's a private building. So I think, you know, we have to be mindful of all of these things that that people and neighborhoods are engaging with. I mean, how are those used to how can it help us continue to thrive and, and grow in our places? Hmm. But I'm, to take a step back to your previous answer as well, I'm, I'm intrigued by this concept of, uh, you know, what it means to be a better place. And I think this is something that we're really interested in. You, know, you, you look at our very name, and it's in there. But I, I'm wondering, you kind of uh, seem to imply that there's an empirical sense of what what goes into making a place better. Is that uh, are there indicators that you think are usually there, or how do you define that in your mind? 
Well, I mean, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously deal with kind of the physical construct, right, the hardware in the space to, 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 to allow for, you know, which we, we kind of talk about the metaphorical and, and literal creation of stages for a community to kind of, uh, kind of uh, take hold of and be a part of. But, but um, that doesn't really kind of get down to also, you know, the, the soul of the city as well, which is a whole other aspect of the work that we're you know, trying to understand more with every project and how do we manifest that. But, uh, but yes, I think there's a design of a city, you know, that, you know, that if if you look at, you know, and I I often tell people, I'll try to, I'll try to work backwards and and maybe you you take an image, like, so let's say you take an image of a, of a senior citizen, you know, riding a bicycle, uh, in a, you know, with a, you know, a dog in her basket in the front and a baguette, maybe in the the back (laughs) on the back rack, like, when you see that image and that's maybe something you'd see in, in, in maybe Amsterdam or uh, Copenhagen or some, one of these highly livable cities, you see, well, there's a, there's an entire uh, uh, infrastructure uh, and land use that goes around for, uh, that, that makes that image possible. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, it, like you, you have to realize like, well, there's a dog in the basket. There's probably a small park that she can let the dog out in and, and walk, but also she obviously bought a bag a loaf of bread, so she must be somewhere where she can go out and get a baguette. She obviously lives close. If it's a senior, uh, they're probably uh, uh, more risk averse, and so that the infrastructure that they're riding on has to be a certain way, has to be more compelling. Um, so, so when I talk about kind of like what it what it takes to kind of what what makes a great place, I think we all, we, I think all people would agree, like a great place is one where you know it's it's vibrant, it's it, it feels alive. You know, it has kind of a rich, small, you know, local businesses, uh, has a, has a character. Uh, and so it's like, how do you work backwards? You know, once you understand what it is that people agree upon makes a great place and start kind of embedding those elements into the space. Hmm. That's interesting. Cause I, I, I certainly, when I listen to you describe those elements that make up a better place, I can't disagree with any of those. And yet it, it often seems like it's hard for, uh, communities to come up with a shared vision of how to how to accomplish that 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 relatively uh, innocuous or or, or easy sounding uh, uh, final result. So how how do we kind of uh, transcribe and, and get and get past that that difficult to to accomplish shared vision? And how do you get people to really understand that we're most of us are talking about the same thing? Well, I mean, the, our approach. Uh, is is to kind of just go out there and start assembling it and, and giving t- mm. people the opportunity to create it and then to experience the space in a different way. Um, obviously, you know, I know this has been, I mean, this is a well-known uh, kind of concept is that we built our infrastructure around um, the car over a series of, you know, uh, uh, half a century or more. And so what we're dealing with is kind of the byproduct of that right now in our, in our places. Um, and the other issue that we, we face with that is that, you know, um, we've come, we've become reliant on these things. And, and, and so the idea of, of taking away that infrastructure or minimizing it is, is going to automatically, you know, result in, 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 in kind of outrage in a neighborhood, understandably. Uh, and just in, you know, to support that, you know, we've developed the zoning and everything else that kind of separates it and makes it more compelling to use. So, you know, what we've had to, we had to do is say, look, we recognize that this is, you know, this is now part, become part of our life, not only our lifestyle, it's also a status symbol and all these other things for us. How can we, well, what we have to do is like, we have to rapidly transform the space because if you, if you take it over time and people are going to be really uncomfortable, but. Uh, but also how do you rapidly do it and then make the space irresistible for people, mm. irresistible for pedestrians, irresistible for cyclists. If you're going to take away this auto environment, you have to do everything you can to make it so compelling that they'll say, okay, this is worth replacing that other type. Uh, and, and you're still going to get people that are going to be opposed to that. But um, but nobody would disagree. I mean, I think if you showed people images of like what kind of place do you want and you had one that had like, um, I'm, you know, one of the images kind of is like a town square with, you know, young people and old people and, and markets and it's just lively and kids playing outside and seniors sitting on benches and people riding bicycles. You showed them that image or you showed them an image of an eight lane road with big box stores and, you know, uh, kind of more 
what I would think I would think of as being dystopic kind of an image, <laughs> but just a, but what we but what we live with on a daily basis. They, I think, I don't think there's anybody that would look at those two images and not say, oh, I'd much rather have the one that has the vibrant life uh, on the street with people uh, and, and not the, the auto-oriented one. Um, the problem is, as we know, getting to that image is, uh, is, is extremely difficult because, again, you're giving something up. Um, so we have to kind of figure out how do you, how do you show people this, this alternative, uh, uh, better place? Do you, in some ways, is it about uh, allowing them to imagine a future? Because I think many times this is about we've we've told ourselves that there's no alternative to the car, or there, there's no alternative to big box stores. Is it about reinvigorating, excuse me, reinvigorating that imagination to some degree? Uh, yeah, I think so. And realizing, and also letting them know, like, yes, we can. It's actually not uh, impossible. I think it, I think it seems like such a daunting task when you look at the built environment. You think man, what it's going to take to get there is going to be dramatically mm. difficult, but it's kind of that saying, you know, like, how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's one, you know, one spoon, spoonful at a time. Right. <laughs> so it's like this, you, it's the same kind of concept. We, we just basically give you a starting point and saying like, look, we're going to, need to actually create the framework for you. So you can see what it's like temporarily, but then we're kind of, you know, we'll also hopefully a couple of things will get accomplished. People in the community will understand like, Oh, because everyone I think is natively, an urbanist to get these concepts. I think they, they want them as well, but we, we show them, you know, through the co-creation process that it's possible and, and we understand the value of this thing. And also here are these, here are the beginning steps that are needed in order to make hmm. those changes. I think that really gets to part of what I find so compelling about your work, which is, um, you know, you've done these many different projects and it seems to me as I read through kind of your narrative that uh, it's really about you just, thought there was something to do and you did it, uh, which I don't think is always the way that we think about these things. We often wait and hope that someone else is going to take care of it. So how do you kind of, uh, besides providing opportunities, how do you make sure that people actually take up that, that baton and, and become leaders and change makers in their own right? So, well, I mean, our, our approach to that is, you know, we're often invited into these neighborhoods. Uh, well, we're always invited if we're doing a project. Uh, and typically by uh, people in the community that are having those questions of like, look, we recognize there's a problem. We realize there's a better way to move forward. We just don't know how to begin. So I, I tell people, honestly, a lot of our work, I mean, I would say almost 80% of our work is just giving people permission to do what they've already, already want to do. Hmm. Um, they know what's wrong. They just don't know. They just, they don't, they don't feel like they're allowed to make those changes. So that, that is one giant piece of the puzzle uh, the next piece that we do and we do, you know, very specifically that maybe most people don't have the access to is that we, we, we can we provide the tools and resources uh, for them to, to assemble the materials and the organizational framework that's necessary for a community to actually make those changes. I think, you know, I remember even with my own neighborhood, you know, we talk about this, this idea of like people feel helpless uh, to, to make change and they see like it has to be some outside force that's going to come in like this master developer is going to make this change and, and I hope that they're in line with our vision for our community um, what I was trying to show is that you know the you know the public realm belongs to the public like I said the streets and the sidewalks and and we can very much shape those um, and again if you shape them a certain way um, it's going to it's going to result in a certain type of land use on side of those things, and so that's the thing I don't think people realize. And that was one of my frustrations even early on was this idea that um, you know we have this conversation of like we need bike lanes here, and then we'd have kind of this one private developer on this one block say I don't want them, and like <laughs> well, but this isn't about your block, you know, this is about <laughs> this is going to connect the entire city, right? This is for our our community, but realizing like, well, of course we are helpless in this situation. And then what's happening is the city was listening to this one developer and so we're like, well, they're bringing their tax base in and they're doing all these other things, understandably. But we found that we can kind of take that, you know, we can short circuit that process when they, when they were just listening to this one master developer and we could take our roads back ourselves. We could just hmm. paint our own bike lanes. And then we could show people, look, it's not the end of the world. And when we did that, uh, the developers, the, the, first of all, the planners or those, those master developers came in and they're like, you know, oh great, the community is actually organized and they can actually disrupt this. We can't use the, t the typical processes where we can just interrupt things through the city, you know, through 
funding politicians and, you know, and just working into these kind of backdoor city staff because you know, villagers can, can assemble and make change on their own. And that's not something anyone ever anticipated. Um, and when you do that, it shows people another alternative mm-hmm. uh, option mm-hmm. for their for their places. And then once people see that, I think at that point, I think they recognize like, oh, we're being kind of driven by these handful of folks. But while we actually have the key to do this, uh, and then they can see how the, you know, you know, this next part of the equation that we are not, I think, addressing to, to the level that we would like to. Um, and, and it's difficult through our process just because we're, we do short-term interventions, but it's this idea of like, how do you get the keys to the community to actually develop the beside this public realm now? And that, because, you know, if you look at the great cities that have existed for you know, a thousand years or more, even hundreds of years, you know, if you look at a block, it's not done by one single master. Um, it, it was done by, you know, a, a 10 or 15 different, you know, uh, individuals or small, you know, groups of people that would kind of build one building at a time and kind of attach them together. And so I think we've forgotten how to do that. And, 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 and we're trying to figure out, you know, we're trying to show people that the great places in the world kind of have a similar, you know, framework to them. And uh, the reality is that we don't know how to, how to make that framework anymore. And so we're having to learn ourselves. We're having to reverse engineer the, hmm. you know, the great places. And so that's what you see through a better block. I mean, we've basically gone in and said, okay, well, what makes, what makes the, the German beer garden so amazing. It's a you know three hundred year old concept that keeps working. So we'll study it and then we'll try to figure out how do how do we we build that ourselves or how do we go to you know look at the classic high street in London and like okay this is working it's working well how do we reverse engineer that and put that into a space or how do you make that great uh, zocalo like in Mexico City and try to study those or, or the great Italian uh, piazza and then how do you reverse engineer that in Akron Ohio or you know Duluth you know uh, because they're, these these concepts are, you know, many times hundreds of years old. They're like these classic like recipes, these classic like bread recipes. So, hmm. and it's, they're tried and true, and we know they work. Um, you know, so our thing is like we're, we keep trying to reinvent the wheel in these communities, but but we could actually pull out these old recipes and apply them. And when we build them in places, it's amazing to see the lights turn back on and people fill them up naturally. What's well, interesting, as uh, you know, this it kind of sounds like uh, you know between the permission side of things and, and as you describe how these places are built, that there's really uh, I'm not hearing a particularly large role for government in there. Is that something that uh, you you kind of see? Is that this is this should mainly be driven from the private sector? Uh, well, no, I, I mean, I, I when I, people tell me, you know, I guess my frustration early on when I, when I when I would kind of I was upset with government in the process. Um, what I had to learn was that, you know, well, first of all, we, the people are the government. Mm. So, so if I'm mad at the government, I've got to be mad at ourselves. Mm. Um, but then, uh, but also I had to understand the role of the activist. And I think as an organization, we, we're continuing to kind of, uh, uh, create tools and resources for the activist because, um, there's a way to make change in neighborhoods. Uh, and I think there's, there's one way that you start, which is kind of this polarizing, we're mad and the government's bad. And that just ends up kind of shutting everybody down. Uh, and it creates these major divides. Um, what we had to learn, like if you want bike infrastructure, you have to be pretty specific. You have to say, okay, this street here that runs through this neighborhood, which is, you know, 40 feet wide, we would like to take it and turn it to 30 feet and you could put five feet bike lane wide bike lanes of this area. Like if we can provide that the tools and resources and draw these designs up and give them to the city. And then we show by testing it out with the community that a, it'll work and it's not going to be Carmageddon. Uh, and B we've rallied the neighborhood. So we've done the community engagement piece. We've done a lot of the work the city uh, already uh, has to do in these projects. Um, and then the next piece is, you know, knowing that city staff will put their neck out for you once you've assembled. But as soon as they hear a no, it can, and it can literally be just one person will come in and say, I'm opposed to this. You know, a city is like a turtle. They'll put their heads out for you. And then if you don't show up to support them saying, look, we took our risk. And this one person said, no, they put their heads back in, their, in the shell. So, so we had to learn like, okay, as activists, when are we assembling and when are we continuing to apply pressure to make that change come in permanently? Hmm. So, so that, that's, you know, it's, I, I'm, you know, I definitely, there's definitely a role for a government, but, you know, I, I also understand the, 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 net, the, the realities of, of the public private partnership. You know, if you're going to create a great public realm, the way to maintain that and have it taken care of and programmed 
honestly, there, there are some, some, some government tools you can use, but for the most part, you're going to need those small private businesses that are local in the area. So you built this great bulb out, for instance, or plaza, you know, allow a coffee shop in the neighborhood to set up, let them generate income and create jobs for the neighborhood, but also have them take care of putting the chairs out and, and taking care of the landscaping and picking up the trash before and after. Uh, they have a, a, a vested interest in taking care of the area, but they also, you know, have a financial incentive to make sure it's maintained as well. And otherwise, we're going to put that that onus back on the government, right? And we just, and then that's where we start saying, well, we just don't have the resources and spread thin. So I'm very much looking for ways to, you know, catalyze and and, and support uh, an improved public realm by um, the you know the the kind of co. Uh, management of the space by by a, a small local business. Hmm. Well, it's, uh, it sounds fascinating, particularly in terms of I think that you guys, you know, you talked a little bit about moving quickly, and and you know your stuff is has sometimes been these short term actions that you know hope to you hope to lead to something more. But that through those, I think uh, you know you're you're emphasizing exactly the areas where government doesn't work well in some ways in terms of government moves slowly and they're scared and they don't want to take a risk. Um, and so there's all these balances I can already hear that, you know, the, you need to push in some places, you need to be patient in other places, but that uh, really all the tools are available and you need to use different ones at different times. That's right. That's right. Very much so. Interesting. Well, you know, it's been uh, part of what's been so fascinating to f- watch your stuff grow with Build a Better Block in particular <laughs> is, you know, seeing this idea that was a, a very local idea that you you guys put on when it was very successful and seeing that turn into something like a worldwide phenomenon. And I wonder how that's kind of changed your perception of the idea and how that's kind of, uh, how you think about this idea differently now that it's more than just a local project. Um, yeah. I, so the way maybe I think the kind of that, the worldwide kind of, uh, kind of adoption of the idea, what, how that's kind of, what it's made me ask, the questions I've asked is like, well, why are people responding to this so much? Why is this? What? Why? What is? Why is this a thing? You know, and what I found, you know, at least even at the, at the worldwide level, is that there is actually a lack of community engagement, mm-hmm. uh, and people feel and, and, and people want better places. They want them, you know, in thirty days, not thirty years. And so, what I found they're responding to is this: like, look, we. Have, we all agree there's things that are broken and then collectively when we come together, we can make change. Um, but many of us don't even gather. Um, so it's, I think maybe one of the big takeaways I had found is, is just recognizing that giving people an excuse to gather, uh, and rally around a shared vision is, is powerful on its own. Um, and, and, you know, we provide really simple ways for people to get, take part. You know, we, you know, we, and you've been seeing, you know, we've gone down into digital fabrication now and developing these, uh, you know, these, you know, uh, designs that can be cut out from, you know, dig- through digital fabrication mean, uh, means that people have access to in many cities, you know, to uh, assemble public space furniture rapidly. Like they can build a series of planters and park benches and bus stops, and they can do it within an hour or two with, with just six or seven people in the neighborhood. Um, so, so we found that ability to, to people people to gather in their neighborhood, but be to actually manifest something in a way that that reshapes that built environment because people feel like they can't change their their spaces anymore. They feel like they're not allowed to. Giving them that permission to and showing them that they can that's a pretty powerful powerful way to bring people together. Um, and, and and at that point, you know, the ball's in their court to kind of take this momentum they've taken and this gate this this enhance social capital and this making connections and understanding what they can, they can and can do, uh, can manifest itself in, in, in a lot of different ways afterwards from these projects. Why do you feel like these people don't think they have permission or don't think that they can make a difference? You know, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, well, first of all, I, I know I'll, I'll take it back to wherever I was starting. Uh, you know, I, traveled, you know, I would go to a Copenhagen and I'd see this great bike infrastructure. I'd go to, you know, somewhere in Italy and see this great town square and I'd come back home and I'd be like, man, I wish this was in my neighborhood, but I guess it just, 
It just will never happen. So uh, maybe I'll just, and I was frustrated because I'm saying I'm spending 50 hour, uh, fifty weeks out of a year, you know, out of 52 weeks out of a year, 50 of those weeks I'm spending uh, in, a pla- in, in a place. And I'm taking two weeks uh, out of my life to go off and, and, and spend that time for my vacation in a place I would rather be. <laughs> and then I come back home and I'm back to that 50 week kind of grind. And so there was this, kind of this reality of this disconnect and, and then this, and then even seeing my friends, you know, you know, as some of these other cities started becoming, you know, smarter about this, this reality of livable places like the Portland of the world and Austin, you know, they were attracting all of my friends who were leaving my city. And that was, and then you'd also hear about these businesses that would say, like even right now with Amazon looking for their new headquarters, well, if you look at their bullet points on what they're looking for, they're looking for livable city things, you know, like we want public transit close by, we want, you know, a great, you know, a great thriving dive downtown, we want the, a place that has, you know, it's good for kids. It's like these, like, why aren't we doing these things anyways? Why do we need to? You know, and that was my frustration. I think we, you know, we've, we've built an environment based on just going, going to work and going home and maybe going somewhere in between on uh, once or twice a week. But for the most part, it's, 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 you're not living in these places. They're, they're not alive. They're not vibrant. And the thing is you can get them on an airplane and you can in a couple hours be in one of these places that are alive. So it's not hard to understand what's, what's, you know, I think the, the the frustration or, or where people I think feel helpless is when they when they they can see this but they don't know they don't know the path of like well that happened because of this X Y and Z that was this individual or this you know person that had you know this Elon Musk like character that came mm-hmm. to the neighborhood that could make these changes but but you know Portland wasn't that way Portland had just a handful of you know people that that were all agreed that you know what we want to have you know a great place for our kids you know in our downtown and so they make this great plaza downtown and they're like we want to have a great you know farmer's market and in, in, in our neighborhoods and they they make those changes and you know that cumulatively over 30 years it makes a pretty amazing place um so you know that's why yeah, i think people just decide to pick up and leave as opposed to like kind of trying to change their places they're like i'd much rather experience that space especially when they're super mm-hmm. frustrated because the cities aren't making those changes which kind of raises this really fascinating question that I'm sure you'd, you'd say that really it's very rewarding to be engaged in creating these places, and yet people don't seem to want to put the work in to do it. Yeah, uh, it, it's definitely rewarding. Well, I mean, I would say people do want to put the work in. Uh, once we get them involved, they, they, they realize there's a path. Uh, but again, I think the reason why they're not getting involved now is because they just they feel complacent. Like mm. this is just a lot I've been given in life, <laughs> and so they, they've kind of just thrown their hands in the air. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today: the Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So a big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. Do you think that some of that is because uh, we haven't, for many years, we haven't really valued public space very much and so that we don't... Uh, or even a space where we are together. Uh, and so we almost wind up as more as individuals and we don't think about this. And so when you finally see the power of what it can be collectively to be together in a space, that that kind of changes your perception and, and hopefully awakens that uh, that idea that any, that new things are possible. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we've become like frogs in boiling water. This has been a, a process that's happened to us, you know, over a series of, of, of years and decades and then it just, I think you look back after 30 or 40 years and you're like, wait a second, what, you know, what have I given up by, <laughs> by going after all of these 
these, you know, conveniences, you know, a, you know, a car to get around a big house that's cheaper, you know, because it's out in the middle, you know, far away and I've got more space. You, you, you start seeing another life though from other people. And again, I think that's, you know, what's happened through the, you know, the age of the internet is that people can, can, and you know, low fare airlines and things like that. People can see other places rapidly uh, and see what, uh, what other options are out there for them. Um, so I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I think people are just uh, are, are highly are far more aware right now uh, <laughs> uh, of uh, of what great places look like, and I think that they recognize that they, they over time uh, they, they I mean I, that's what even my parents you know who are you know uh, their late sixties they're you know they're, they're an empty nesters but they're like you know I don't think I want to stay in this big house mm-hmm. far away it takes me you know forever to get everywhere I'd much rather be I mean everyone is getting at this idea of like I want to be in a place that feels alive. And that feeling of alive, that means all that translates to is communities um, kind of coming up against each other, you know, a lot of them. And those places they come up against each other are in these public spaces, honestly. Interesting. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, you mentioned earlier, like this difficulty of taking these short-term actions and turning them into long-term change. And I think that I've heard through some of your stuff how important champions, uh, uh, identifying champions and empowering them and giving them the tools necessary to move forward are for that. But is uh, do you think that there's a timing element to it as well, that sometimes uh, you can be in not the right time in a community or that there's that there can be an accumulation effect of different pressures that eventually push something over the edge that allow change to happen? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that, you know, you know, it's a Martin Luther King Jr. quote, but that you know, it's always the the time is always right to do what's right. <laughs> um, but I will say there is a there are usually it's individuals who kind of feel a sense of ownership of these spaces, um, and that they can kind of gum up that process of like making a more an improved place for their neighborhoods. And, and understandably, sometimes it's because you know fears of gentrification, uh, it's fears of uh, maybe it's something that's uh, racially charged because there was, you know, the uh, government was was dishonest and, and, and oppressed, you know, entire populations. Or maybe it's, you know, uh, somebody who's owned lots of businesses or buildings in the area, and they just want to, they're like, you know, what, this is, I own all this space, and I don't want you to change what I have here. And there's all kinds of reasons, uh, some valid and some maybe, you know, questionable on why change doesn't take place, but. Um, but again, I think that if you can gather your neighborhood together and come up with like, what is that shared, that simple, what are those shared simple things that we want? Like, you know, is that maybe it's that realization of like, Hey, we all realize we have to get in the car to get a gallon of milk. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's not the best way to move forward. Like, or, you know, we all used to ride bicycles to school, but we don't now. Like, well, why don't we? Like, well, because they're going to get run over and it feels unsafe. Like, well, we, you know, the roads didn't really change. We, they're, they're just as bad as they were before. Like, why do we feel we're going to get run over now? And so then what can we do to kind of change things? Because that wasn't a bad way to get around. We all enjoyed that. It was healthy and it made more sense. So, you know, it's, you know, I think there, there's always, there's always ample room to improve a place. The, the hard part is kind of like, you know, the hard part is it's the individuals coming up with every worst case scenario. There's, there's, you know, there's a, I, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize the fact that you, you can open Pandora's box, you know, by making change, obviously, uh, you know, we all know what that looks like. Um, but you know, there's a, you know, there's a guy named, uh, Richard Feynman. I like a lot. He's a physicist, you know, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. And anyways, he, he talked about going to, you know, study, uh, and he met with a kind of a Buddhist monk and this Buddhist monk had told him at some point in time, you know, um, you have everything, you have all, everything you need to open the keys really to open, uh, the gates of heaven. But that same key that, that you have inside you also opens the gates to hell. And so the reality is there's nothing you can do that doesn't have an equal and opposite reaction, mm. basic physics. And so that's where you hear people don't make change because, you know, if you improve that area, then then Starbucks is going to come in and it's going to do this or or or, or, or <laughs> do make change. But no, this is going to happen. I mean, so it's that's going to be a reality. That's that's humanity. That's civilization. That's society moving in together. Um, but I don't, I think we can always kind of return to well, what ultimately 
do we care for and value and how do we preserve those things and how do we enhance the things that we value as well in these places? Well, I'm really intrigued. Like that's, that sounds a, so straightforward, but B, we, we know how difficult it can be, as you mentioned. And I wonder, uh, you know, it's traditionally been even more difficult and, and traditionally oppressed neighborhoods and, and neighborhoods that have had difficulties. And I wonder how do you kind of, uh, you know, those groups almost have a harder time, I think, often getting to that point of even having the conversation about what a shared vision is, not even that it's that much harder to get to it. But I wonder how how you can go into those conversations and, and is it just starting with more trust or, or how do you begin to have those conversations in traditionally oppressed neighborhoods? Well, I mean, what we, what we'll do is, you know, when we come in, we'll say, you know, oftentimes in these neighborhoods, they've already done visioning exercises and they've done a lot of planning and they haven't seen a lot of things happen. Mm. And so, and then when things do, and they, so these plans get thrown on shelves. So, so there's distrust gets built. And the only way you're going to create trust in neighborhoods is by, especially as a government, uh, is by manifesting what it is they, that they, they value and they want. And if you, if you walk away from that, that's a really, you create more problems mm. than you, you make by have, bringing people together. Um, so I will say, well, when we walk into a lot of these neighborhoods and they, they immediately have that distrust, arms folded, like, you know, who's this and what are you doing here? And so what the nice thing that we've, we've been able to do with our work is be like, look, we know you've gotten all this planning. You're just all this talk. You've not seen a lot of things happen. The only thing happens is in the private realm and you're seeing yourself get displaced or these things happen. So we're going to come back, you know, in 60 or 90 days and we're going to swing some hammers. And it's going to be based on what we've already found that you said that you value what you want. And that's such a jarring kind of, uh, kind of idea for people that we found because they're just not used to people actually coming together and, uh, and helping manifest these things. They're just used to kind of talk sticky notes and maps and charrettes. <laughs> um, so that I've found had a lot to, to build, uh, you know, to build trust and to realize like, you know, you know we're really in this to make a, a great place. And, you know, the next part though, I, I would say is, you know, really what makes these places great are, is the local character. It is the mm-hmm. local identity of these places. And, and so and when we know historically, I mean, what's happening with gentrification is a market force at the end of the day. Uh, and so what we are, we're trying to do with these neighborhoods is go in and say like, look, if the neighborhood is going to improve, how can we teach you how to improve it? A, so you're the one, you're the one getting the jobs to do this. This is not difficult to make cafe seating or public benches or park benches. Like, how are we teaching you guys how to build these things? You know, how to create these local businesses that everybody, you know, wants in the neighborhood. How are we teaching you so somebody on the outside doesn't create these? So you can capture the wealth in these places. But then the next level is how do we manifest, you know, the unique character that you have uh, in these communities into the built environment, just like you go to Chinatown or a little Italy, it's manifested into the built environment. You know where you're at. It's, it's a very uh, identifiable culture in the space uh, because that's what makes a place special. You know, it makes a, that's what built you know pride in place, and that's what people are frustrated with when they see that get washed or pushed away. So you know, our, our work is trying to do a lot of things very really rapidly for these communities. Um, but again, we're up against. You know, if, if it's a, if it's an inner city neighborhood, we're up against, you know, a, a, a natural ticking clock of urbanism that's coming in and, and wanting and looking for low priced spaces to quickly, you know, uh, build these, you know, giant kind of homogenous things. And so we're, 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 we're having to work quickly. But the ir- irony is, I mean, we work in all kinds of contexts. We're also working in these rural areas that have the exact opposite issue <laughs> where they're dealing with like depopulations and they're trying to figure out how to get people to stay or how to get more people to come, actually come back and, and to create businesses in these places. So, so it's an interesting dichotomy that we, when we face with our work, like the rural <laughs> realization of like holding people, bringing people in, you know, and then the inner city, you know, uh, uh issues of, of people too many people coming in and making change too quickly uh, and trying to you know uh, help kind of ease all of those things for, for, for both both kind of uh, these these kind of uh, landscapes hmm. that's so fascinating and it's you know it, it really speaks to the power of a need for contextual understanding when you go into these projects and I, I, I can't yeah. imagine you know some of the differences and how you know, you have this this idea of what you want to do, but it has to look very different in 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 rural Texas versus 
in the middle of Philadelphia, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. And there's completely different sensitivities, but there's also, it's also very similar personality types though, too, that, that, that you're, you're, <laughs> but just kind of looking at things from different spectrums, but it's an, it's an interesting kind of the thing. The thing is what makes a great place is pretty much the same everywhere you go though, whether it's in Italy or it's in Mexico or South Africa or the U S it's, it's not, it's, it's not rocket science. They're made up of the same kind of ingredients really. Um, and so I think that's what tra- getting people to understand what those ingredients are. And I, you know, I, I fall back on like kind of Christopher Alexander kind of codifying some of that with pattern language, you know, he, you know, studying timeless places, what places that are look like that are a thousand years old that are still working that are rural and then some other city. And, um, you know, but the, the interesting thing is that we just keep, uh, you keep breaking those molds, and those models and wondering why these places aren't working anymore. It's like, well, we, we know, you know like we just, aren't applying the, uh, the, the right thing for some reason. Hmm. Well, as someone who's traveled all over and worked in many different places, when you, when you kind of go into a new place, what are some of the indicators that you're looking for to let you know the character of a place, to let you know what some of the challenges are, let you know if a place is doing really well? Well, for me, you know, if a place is doing really well, I, I like to see, a, a, you know, a lot of small local businesses kind of clustered together, kind of supported like symbiotic, but working together to help uh, each other and help themselves that are also kind of the eyes on the street, kind of what Shane Jacobs talks about, but also, you know, as a public realm being used, these being used well, is, the, is public transit working or is it not working? Um, is it, uh, is there an AM PM environment? Um, is there a, is there a soul? You know, that's the other big part of this that's missing. You know, you can fix the hardware, but the soul, like we can think of cities that have soul, like New Orleans, you immediately think of it and it has a soul. It's rich with, with life, but you know, Austin's got a soul, but you know, you would think of maybe another city like Dallas where I live, it doesn't have a soul. Um, so what is it? What, what are those things that make up a soul of a space? Uh, and how, and how do we, you know, what do you put together to, to make that soul manifest itself? Like, look at Burning Man. It, it's just, you know, it's this party in the desert that built a city in two weeks. But, <laughs> but it's a city that's rich with soul, right, and ritual and all the other things that you see in these other places uh, around the world that are, you know, a thousand years old that have soul. So it's like we know how to – we can make these places too. There's, there's a mix of, you know, art and irreverency and reverency all at once. Hmm. Um, you know, there's a food, there's a, there's a, da- there's a music, there's a dance, there's a, there's a, uh, there's all kinds of things. Um, but I think that, you know, the places that don't have these things don't have this soul, you know, we've, we've, we've separated ourselves and we've isolated ourselves and we've built, you know, an infrastructure that to come together to make this soul take place. It's fascinating. I, I think that soul is so often underrated and so so hard to measure sometimes, but it's definitely a, a, a very important part of things. Yeah. Well, those are the places that you want to be. That's where yeah. you go. That's where you vacation to. People don't vacation to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, and don't, don't get me wrong. I love Houston. I'm in Texas, and my sister lives there, and I, and I go there for work. But I'm, you know, I'm going to Buenos Aires. <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to Houston. I'm not, I'm not going to, if I lived in Houston, I wouldn't be going to Dallas. You know, I'd go to, you know, any, anywhere else. I'd go to New Orleans, you know, cause I want to, I want to see, you know, a kid in the street playing a trombone and I want to see, you know, and I it feels the freedom to do that, you know, and I want to see, you know, just street, you know, amazing street food that's made up of the area and just in people dancing in the streets, you know, that's, I want to go somewhere that's alive. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to ask the question of like, why are some places that have, a million of people not alive and there's there's probably a series of rules and regulations and infrastructure we created that um, stopped that from taking place hmm. that's interesting as you like listed off some of those cities i couldn't help but think that they're all places that have a really solid sense of history in some ways uh which is i don't i'm sure that plays into it but it also makes me think about you know, newer places. And so I'm thinking about Bill Gates has announced he's building this big city or manufacturing this big city and, and Google is now doing this thing in Toronto. And I'm thinking, how hard is that to build a soul when you don't, when you don't engage your history or you don't have a history to engage? Yeah, that's, 
that's I mean that's a good question. Um, but again, I, maybe I can kind of go back to Burning Man. It, there's not really a history there, and it creates a soul rapidly. So it's reverse engineering that. And again, what is what that, what's happening there? You have those places. Or you look at that place specifically, it's this, this, it's thousands of people coming together with a sense of freedom uh, and, and, and a lack of inhibition. I mean, you can't dance in the street unless you feel a lack of inhibition. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, and then of course that maybe is taken to a hedonistic extreme there, but, but it, it, people are going there because they are, they are missing that in their cities. They're like, I, and, and they come away with this reverential, experience like oh my god i've seen life in a whole new way and i understand things now and i can never go back to what i what i saw before and what they're describing is kind of a religious epiphany <laughs> that exists i think on a weekly basis in new orleans <laughs> or in, in in rio de janeiro like that's that's just the way they live mm. and so so we go to a burning man <laughs> to experience it and just like without realizing like actually and i say this because i go to new orleans quite a bit when my your friends just moved there and, and I just, you know, I walk in the streets and we just took a part of this, part of this crew. And, and I went to this bar at 1 PM on a Monday, you know, there's a jazz band playing and I talked to the guy afterwards who's, you know, the banjo player. I was like, so what's your day job? And he was just like, this is my day job. I was like, your day job is you play banjo in a 1920s band. Like you can do that for a living. He's like, well, here I can. <laughs> I was like, well, here you can. That's amazing. Like, and so, and, but he's like, I couldn't do that where I lived in, you know, Sacramento, California, but I could do it here. And I was like, that's incredible. And how do we, why is that? You know, why, why is that, why is that possible? And why is that not the norm as opposed to that being the exception? Mm -hmm. Well, you heard it here, folks. If you're an urbanist and you want to learn how to build a city with a soul, uh, you should attend Burning Man as frequently as possible. I think that's the biggest takeaway. <laughs> there. <laughs> there you go. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Jason, I, we're, I'll start bringing this to a close, uh, uh, although I hate to do so, but I, I wonder if you could share kind of something that you've learned along the way of doing this that was kind of unexpected or maybe you didn't think that you'd think was so important at this point. Uh, yeah, I'll say kind of maybe – picking up on that thread of the soul. Um, I was in a, you know, I've been fortunate because I get to travel quite a bit for work now and speaking all over the world. And I was in a Lisbon, Portugal this summer and uh, my host was taking me around and we were kind of going through the old town squares and the different kind of little neighborhood squares. And at one point I'm in this one area of town and it's all locals and it's it, people are eating, uh, you know, grilled, uh, uh, fish outside and we're uh and we're watching everyone dance in the street you know to this kind of local band that's playing this local music and um and i see this grand grandmother who's probably about 70 years old dancing with her granddaughter who's probably mm -hmm. 17 and i'm just watching this and they're doing this very traditional unique dance and i was i told my host like that's amazing what are they doing and he describes the dance it's kind of local historic dance it's been around i was like that's just beautiful it's amazing to watch and i said what the amazing thing is is that in my neighborhood where i live or even in, in the u.s like you will never see a 17 year old girl dancing with a 70 year or 70 year old grandmother in a public street like this that's not that's probably not going to happen and he said oh that's interesting to hear because yeah we all do that like Honestly, if we if we lost that, I mean, that's how we translate. That's how we give the information to our future generations about our heritage and what we we love and value. Like, if we lose that, we will lose we'll lose everything. And I thought, wow, we've lost that. That's that's our issue. Um, and so uh, I think you know, it's this when I come back to this the search for a soul, like we we've kind of jettisoned the soul of our, our places. A few of our cities have them, and and we. We, we wear them with pride and we love those places. Uh, and oftentimes we're just trying to figure out how do you turn the soul back on these places if they exist, they're just kind of trapped inside of the full walls. Hmm. Wow, what a, what a beautiful story. That's, a, that's amazingly compelling. And I almost, I almost hate to, to, to not end it there, but I wonder if you could kind of share a, a final story with us that touches on what, uh, what do you think can happen when a community really embraces itself and starts to uh, think positively and, and, and move in a good direction? Um, well, I think, I think just that, I think it's, it's that idea of if a people, if, if a community recognizes that they have all the tools and resources they need to fix their places, which is, we find they do. Um, 
um, that there's nothing that they can't manifest. There's nothing, there's not an ethos they can't create in their space. There's not, there's not a, 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 a business. There's not a, you know, a culture. There's not a soul that can't be created. Uh, and we've seen it happen now with these projects time and again. So, uh, so for me, that's the exciting part is just this, this opportunity to kind of give people the, 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 the keys to unlock all that. Well, Jason, it's been great hearing from you. And if people are interested in learning more about what you guys are up to, where can they find more information? Uh, you get our website, betterblock.org. Uh, or, uh, you know, we've got videos online. I have a TED Talk, a couple I've given, uh, that you can see on YouTube as well. But uh, but our website should have most all of our uh, projects that are, we're currently working on and learn more and see how they can get involved. Wonderful. And if you all are interested in learning more about CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. Uh, but Jason, thank you so much for taking the time today. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the date for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. That's cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.